Welcome to our panel discussion entitled, Has Social Media Changed Democracy? Uh, the discussion today is brought to you by the Harris School's Project on Political Reform with the support of a grant from Democracy Fund, a uh, foundation established to help strengthen our democratic institutions. Um, I'm going to only make some very brief introductions today because you all should have with you a, a, a sheet of paper with everyone's biography uh, on there. We have a uh, very accomplished and distinguished panel today uh, of uh, uh, digital political professionals who understand the digital environment and uh, the power of digital communications better than almost anyone else. And uh, we have with us uh, Karen Tumulty, from, uh, the national political correspondent from the Washington Post, who will moderate today's panel. Let me uh, make some very brief int introductions. To my immediate left is Roy Temple. Uh, Roy is a veteran political and public affairs strategist and the co-founder of GPS Impact, a democratic digital consulting firm. Next to Roy is Thomas Keeley, a uh, Republican digital uh, strategist and uh, Thomas's clients have included Scott Walker and, and uh, Ron Johnson up in Wisconsin and uh, Bruce Rahner here in, in Illinois. And uh, next to uh, Thomas is Alex Woodward. Alex is the uh, uh, digital organizing director at Organizing for Action, otherwise more commonly known as OFA. OFA started out as the Obama Field Organization and uh, later became a nonpartisan, not-for-profit uh, created to train and support progressive activists and change makers. And next to Alex is Joe Mansour. Joe is uh, the head of the digital practice at FP1 Strategies, one of the nation's top Republican political consulting firms. Uh, FP1's clients have included uh, uh, Senator Rob Portman and Senator Dan Sullivan, uh, Portman from Ohio and Dan Sullivan from, from uh, Alaska, the Republican Congressional Committee, and uh, many others. And uh, uh, next to uh, Joe is Ned Ryan. Ned is the founder and CEO of American Majority, a uh, nonpartisan political training institute whose mission is to identify and, and uh, uh, train uh, conservative activists and change makers. And of course, uh, to my far left, next to, uh, next to uh, uh, Ned is uh, Karen Tumulty, who uh, I think many of you recognize Karen is on campus. Uh, this quarter as a fellow over at the Institute of Politics. And with that, I will turn this over to Karen. Karen, Terrific. thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, and it's great to see a, f a few familiar faces from my, uh, from my stint, which I'm truly enjoying over at the IOP. Uh, this is such a great topic, I think, front and center today. Uh, before I came over here today, I <clears throat> checked back with my mothership at the Washington Post to get what the latest statistics are for our newspaper was social media. And uh, basically, every day, between 30 and 40% of our web traffic comes from social media, not from people typing WashingtonPost.com into their browsers, not from people searching Donald Trump Asia, but specifically and directly from some kind of referral that is coming through some form of social media. And I think that, you know, that is probably the experience that other media organizations are having as well. And so I think well, the first thing I'd like to do is ask everyone um, on our panel, starting with you, Roy. So our question here is, has social media changed democracy? I think we would all agree that it has. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I think most certainly it's both. Um, I knew he was going to do I, that. I think the answer is it's both. And you say pick one, but I can't. Um, I mean, it, has, it is like power, right? It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. Uh, it depends on how it's deployed. <clears throat> so uh, it, it has democratized the sources and, uh, of, of information. Uh, it is also subject to misuse. And I don't think that we have... Uh, the mechanisms in place to sort of figure out how to calibrate that and channel it more toward the favorable and away from the unfavorable uses. And I also think, you know, being here on the grounds of an important research institution, I think there are very important psychological things that we haven't figured out uh, in terms of the way information is processed uh, online. If, if perhaps that's different than some of the other mechanisms, 
and whether or not uh, the way we use social media, the, the way people uh, develop the capacities to respond to the information they get online is keeping pace with the innovations that are occurring on the information presentation side uh, on social media. So I think there are a lot, of, a lot more questions than answers at this point about its ultimate effect on democracy, but we're a pretty vibrant place and hopefully we'll figure it out. So Thomas, what do you think the biggest questions are right now? Um, I think I think some of the the biggest questions are where where are things going next? I think it's I hate to use the word new media, but it's still a new medium in that we're still trying to figure out exactly um, how to use it. Now I think I think social media as a whole um, is good. It, it makes access to politicians a lot easier. Um, it it sort of engages larger audiences. But I think where it gets interesting is once you start to add the money factor to that, uh, particularly in terms of advertising algorithms. Um, to me, I think that's what causes the so-called echo chambers and kind of figuring out different ways to um, remedy that. I think, obviously, uh, avoiding any government intervention in that is going to be the way to handle it, but that might be something we'll discuss later. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's sort of still so many uncharted areas that we need to figure out and figure out how do we want to handle it. Um, and I think that's, that's something that, right now, it makes things even more interesting because you're finally seeing um, all bodies talking about how to handle it as opposed to uh, just the FEC in the past where it was always gridlock and there was never any decision making. Now it seems like everybody wants to make a decision on how to handle social media um, and there's a lot of gray area um, that, that needs to be sorted out before that happens, I think. So, so Alex, can you describe, because you're you having worked, Barack Obama was probably, you know, as, as much as we're now used to the tweeter in chief, it was really, I think, the Obama campaign. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first Obama campaign happened at almost the dawn of the Twitter age. Mm -hmm. What, for a politician trying to get his or her message out, like, what are the best practices? Mm -hmm. The best practices for messaging. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you've hit upon the entire industry's goal. Um, I mean, and I mean by that effectiveness, not. You know, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think social media is limiting in the sense that you only get a certain amount of space to be able to describe what it is. And with the attention spans that people have now, there isn't a whole lot of room for nuance. Um, I think that's something that social media in general is is lacking. As far as best practices, I think it's it's um, it's understanding what is in people's hearts, what's really relevant. Um, so that you're able to speak in a way that's authentic and, and sincere. Um, people don't want to be fed lines. They want, they want to connect to something that, that feels like they're being spoken to. Um, I think one of the things that, that uh, Roy and Thomas have touched on is that there are a lot of questions right now. And we have, um, social media is a tool. And the tools that we shape also in turn shape us. The Industrial Revolution, like we fueled that, but then in turn we adapted to it. The Internet Revolution, we're we're seeing how that's happening, uh, you know, how it's playing out within our own psyches, within our own, um, yeah, political movements in general. But it's it's not simple enough to just uh, get accustomed to, you know, what do we think is going to reach the masses? What's going to get the most clicks? It's much more about how is this a symptom of what we are needing in our political system overall? Um, and how can we actually uh, make space for the long questions, the, the deeper questions, so that we can continue to use social media as a platform that can guide us to where we want to go rather than letting it happen to us? What do you think, Joe? I think Alex really hit on uh, where I was thinking and kind of going, you know, this it's a tool. And tools, you know, they can be used for good, they can be used for bad, but it's a communications vehicle. And I, I love history, and I've sort of read and sort of seen documentaries about the history of radio. And when radio first came on the scene, everyone's like, this is fantastic. We're going to do all this educational programming. And of course, it's used for entertainment and advertising because that's what people want. And, you know, I really think, you know, our sort of societal IQ when it comes to social media needs to raise. Like, we need to learn how to better use it, um, better understand. The, the pieces of it, just like I think, you know, when people got, you know, terrified at the War of the Worlds when that happened and the, you know, H.G. Wells broadcast, everyone was like, oh no, this is real. There, there, there was like a, a lack of, of IQ about what that new medium represented. And I think we're seeing that same thing. And how does that sort of percolate through society, consumer, political, our institutions? 
So, Ned, how, how are politicians changing their behavior as a result of this? I mean, how, how a lot of them were kind of resistant to right. it. A lot of them, you know, have these kind of staff-written, antiseptic kind of sounding social media posts. What, what are you seeing in terms of trends? Uh, you, you're seeing more of them actually start to use it themselves, which in some ways is good, in some ways is, is not great. Uh, but we were just talking last night over dinner about Chuck Grassley is actually, he runs his Twitter handle. He's awesome. And he's very good on Twitter. And, and then there's some other members that it's like, dear God, please don't touch Twitter. No, I think the thing, and, and I tweeted this link out just this morning uh, from the Congress Foundation about statistics and how Congress uses social media how more and more members have gotten adept at using it, how they're starting to use it a lot more, how it's actually connected them better with their constituents. You know, I'm old enough to remember, my dad was in Congress 96 to 2006. If you got 20 letters or 30 letters on the same topic in the same day, that issue went right to the top of the members' uh, you know, uh, uh, priorities. Well, now you're seeing on social media, if they get 30 comments on social media or less, in a short period of time, that issue goes to the top, goes right on the radar. So it, it allows for much more real-time communication with constituents. Mm -hmm. I like it because it adds more transparency and I would think in some ways more accountability because unlike what happens in Vegas, it's supposed to stay in Vegas, what happens online stays online. And so when somebody makes a statement in, uh, DC, uh, in, on the campaign trail, that they're gonna do something and then they go to DC and do something else, it's always really a lot of fun to take that uh, video clip or tweet and say, remember when you said this? Life comes at you fast. But really quick, back to the first question, is it good or bad? And I think we're kind of in the best of times and the worst of times. And so I kind of address, I think, what are some of the best of times? Transparency, accountability, greater relationship with the constituents. And I also think we're kind of in the worst of times. And you know, like Joe, I love studying American history. Our founders were deeply concerned about pure democracy, the rage, the mob mentality, the mob rage. And you look at some of the things that are happening online on, on social media, and in some ways, I think it does kind of highlight why we're trying to avoid pure democracy, because you see this mob mentality. It's almost like an online asylum of people raging at each other and whipping each other into a frenzy. And you realize, in some ways, even though there are benefits, there are also some real negatives. If we, if we don't, and I kind of go back, if, as a, you know, a democratic republic, we're built off the idea of self-governance. And that actually comes down to the personal individual level. And it's, but, it, but it's in some ways irrational to think that people will behave online. I mean, there, I think it was, you have an economist here that just won the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize for uh, Richard Thaler. And his whole, his, his whole premise was people act irrationally with their money. And so I think it's almost irrational for us to think that people will be rational online when they're given the ability to sit in their, their office or their basement or wherever they're sitting tweeting away. So it's one of those things where I think it's, it's a very powerful tool at the same time has a lot of negatives if we're not aware of how we as individuals are using it as we communicate and relate with each other online. Well, I think increasingly, and you know, Thomas brought up the question of whether the government should step in in some of these arenas. I think we've all become very aware in the past year of the degree to which it can be manipulated. And specifically, the question right now is whether it's being manipulated by a foreign government. Um, how big of a threat do any of you think this is? And if so, what is the role of our government here? And what is the role of these social media companies themselves in kind of policing the area, as my father used to refer to it? Not, not to uh, take it, but I, I would love to, to mention the thing that's been amazing to me is that we have not actually called the CIA and the NSA and the DOD and all of the intelligence committee up to the Hill to have hearings. Uh, they have been given billions of dollars to internet security, cybersecurity, all of these things. They were even given a heads up in 2014. Russia is going to increase its efforts to try to attempt to influence elections in Western democracies. They had a heads up. They've been given billions of dollars. And I think one of the untold stories that hasn't really been highlighted that I think we need to go after is pull these guys up to the hill and say, what were you doing? What were you doing with these billions of dollars? You're supposed to be worried about internet security and cybersecurity. And it concerns me a little bit. A couple weeks ago, they brought obviously Google, Facebook, Twitter to the hill, kind of berated them for their lack of, of security and their lack of policing. And I just thought to myself, you're talking to the wrong guys. And trust me, I have issues with all three of those. Uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and I'm 
thrilled to see Josh Hawley, the Attorney General of Missouri, going after Google on antitrust. That all to say, let's have a conversation with our intelligence community and all the money they had, because my concern, I look at it this way, our intelligence community, our national defense is, is to provide a, a parameter, a parameter of defense within which we can have the most freedom. And when we talk about taking away or limiting certain freedoms with social media, again, for better or for worse, we can have that conversation. The whole point is we have to create that free space, and that's what our national intelligence and national defense is for, to keep out these players. And it's not just Russia. I mean, it's China. It's Iran. I mean, you, there's a laundry list of people that are trying to influence our elections. That's why we put billions of dollars into these things. And what happened? Why did we allow this to happen? That's the question for our, our intelligence community. Anybody else? Yeah. Good. I think uh, the, you kind of saw happen what seems to happen with a lot of things. There's an issue and then Congress rushes in thinking they need to pass some legislation to kind of address the issue. So they came up with the, the Honest Ads Act, which if, if you look at it, there's, I don't think there's really any part of it that would have stopped Russia from doing what they were doing. Um, and if, if they go through with that, I don't think it will stop them in the future either. Any one of us here could figure an easy way out around that using a proxy and a PayPal account. But make. they did. I mean, they had some pretty egregious lapses. Like oh, of they course, were of course. For the ads in Russian rubles. Oh, of course. Right. Of course. So, oh, yeah. No, there was so, some obvious stuff that was so, happening. Right? You know, Absolutely. Did they? Right. You know, could you take the next step and not pay for? It? You did an Amazon gift card or something. Of course, but. Prepaid they dropped. Right. They they dropped the ball. Yeah, what is the right. currency of Macedonia? I don't know. Right. 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 But but the thing is, is I think that these companies now, this could be a wake up call for them to start policing themselves. Back in 2011, Twitter actually had a a feature for political campaigns where it has just a little purple icon, and when you hover over it, it showed your campaign disclaimer, and that was a voluntary thing on their part. They weren't required to do it. Um, and I think they were trying to get ahead of the curve, and for some reason they phased that out. They got rid of that. Um, obviously, they have everyone's kind of released their new um, structure for uh, uh, disclosures. I think let these companies police themselves and then you know let them try something because they're going to be able to adjust a lot quicker than any legislation is going to let them do because those are rigid structures. This way, Google can test things, Facebook can test things, Twitter can test things to figure out what makes sense to them. Um, but some of the requirements that they're that they're asking, I think, are they're trying to treat these companies as if they're radio stations or TV stations, which are governed by the FCC, as well as the FEC requirements, which just opens an even wider door of potential things that could happen for social media. And keep in mind, these are these are private companies. But people like Newt Gingrich would argue that they are essentially becoming public utilities. Right, but I think I think this is really. I mean, my I have come from the progressive side of things. I am not typically someone who's overly resistant to the idea of government regulation, at least to the degree that some of my conservative friends might be. But in here, my caution is: I think you need to make sure you understand the system you're about to regulate. Right, right. And I'm not sure, even though that many of the political actors participate in it in some level or people on their be, do so on their behalf, I'm not sure they fully appreciate it. And one of the concerns I have is that they will rush in and reason by analogy. And you know, typically in any, in any uh, system, a regulatory system where you have both a, a, an infrastructure or a distribution network and then a content system, you try and separate those things in a regulatory regime, whether it's electricity, whether it's uh, you know, even the movie industry uh, in the days of old, uh, radio, uh, there's a whole series of, of, of analogies. But the difficulty here is that, though at one level these companies are platforms, they're infrastructures, they, they run a network, but the content is not separable from that network in the traditional way you would regulate. That presents a whole host of complications here because they are, you, you don't have somebody who makes movies and then somebody who tries to show movies. Here, we are the content in many cases. So what you have to do, at, at least if you're gonna try and regulate this, whether it's through self-policing, whether it's through a regulatory regime, you gotta find some way to try and track this back to institutional accountability, right? So you have to have an institution that can be held accountable when someone uses this platform for mischievous or worse purposes. That's one part of it. But I think the other part of it that we shouldn't overlook in this discussion is you also have to have, the, what are the responsibilities of being a modern citizen, right? Yeah. Because you yes. cannot passively consume information that's coming at you and have fulfilled your obligation as a citizen anymore. So what are the skills that we need our educational system? I mean, these are big, grandiose, long-term thoughts, but unless we have citizens that are prepared to look and go, that doesn't make sense. Even though it's what I want to believe, somebody's telling me it's something they want me to believe, I need to have some level of skepticism, not cynicism, but skepticism. Right. 
And that there's some personal responsibility that fits into that with the institutional responsibility on these networks. Last point on the networks, though, that makes this different, it is very, very dangerous, right? Because there are, there are mechanisms built into these platforms that amplify very small things. So it's not about the amount of money you spend, right? Because a lot of people, not, notwithstanding Karen's extraordinary work and her ability as a reporter, a lot of people choose which stories to read on the Washington Post based on the little column on the right-hand side that says most read stories. So if a bunch of people read Karen's story, it makes the list. If a bunch of people don't, they miss it because they don't know to go looking for Karen's work because it's really extraordinary work. Those algorithms that generate that can be gamed. So one of the things you're hearing in the Russian stuff is they had bots that would amplify things on Twitter to get it to trend. That means it puts it in front of people, more people. That, that most read story, amplifying this story over that story has an effect on the political consciousness and it has an effect on what reporters choose to cover. Because guess what? We wrote this story, it got a lot of attention online, it must be what people want to know about, therefore we should do more of those kind of stories. So you can take very small efforts, very small amounts of dollars, you can amplify it because it creates a circle, you know, if you're a fan of systems thinking, it's an amplification loop, it's self-reinforcing, and you've magnified problems a hundredfold of very small stimulus. But you're putting it on the consumer to fix that. No, no, no. I'm saying there's a dual responsibility here. You, you have to have a regime in which you say, you've got to be able to hold, if these platforms provide you know, if Google, Facebook, Twitter provide a mechanism for foreign actors to influence our elections, they have to, there has to be an accountability mechanism. Whether that's a straight regulatory regime, whatever that is, there has to be a mechanism. But you, you also cannot absolve citizens of all responsibility to be discerning in the information that they're consuming for political conversations. I, I think it's, it's got to be a joint. Point on that. I think when you talk about the platforms, and Roy, what just said, talking about the algorithm, there is a there is an opportunity, and I think Facebook in particular recognizes this and is shifting it, of rewarding better behavior right. or, or tracking metrics that are more relevant and more hopefully beneficial to proper news consumption and democracy overall. And so, for example, with Facebook's algorithm and their newsfeed algorithm, previously they have rated highly um, people clicking and sharing a, a post and a content, saying, okay, if I get to share or gets the click, that rate's higher in the algorithm. And what they've actually gone back and found is, okay, a better way, instead of tracking, um, it's a click on a story, and saying, okay, if a story gets more clicks, that gets higher rated in the algorithm. Go back and see people read the story, and then they share it. And if they've read the story and then shared the subsequent story, um, that's a better indicator that um, they found the content more engaging and more useful, and it wasn't sort of clickbaity, and they sort of rate that higher. And I think, I think there are steps that Facebook and Twitter and Google as sort of owners of the platform and the, the landscape can be taking to sort of reward better content, reward better, better information. Um, the other thing I'm gonna say, uh, I'm a conservative Republican. I think, you know, while I tend to agree with Thomas about, you know, less regulation is better, I do think, and I think the platforms are sort of taking steps to self-police, uh, they're, they're getting there. I think there is a role for government to set some standards and say, because what I think would be really, would be a bad outcome is if you have every single platform with their own set of standards and journalists, the public cannot then sort of go to a central spot or create a database that pulls that information down and says, okay, I can see what's being advertised on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google, um, and just kind of look at that across the board. Um, so I think, I think there should be some sort of data standard. I think there should be some sort of baseline that the different platforms need to sort of report into. Uh, I think that would be beneficial. And what about, it, how do you fix or can you fix another big problem, which is just, you know, hate speech, which is bullying, which, you know, it's, I mean, I'm sure neo-Nazis have always been out there, but they've not, it's never been so easy for them to find each other. No, I think, I think one of the, again, negatives of social media is really highlighting some of the um, less attractive aspects of our society. All of a sudden, everybody has the ability to be out there on Twitter, Facebook. I mean, I, I, I think the thing that's interesting is people think some of these division, divisions that we see in the country right now just magically happened overnight. I don't think so. I think they've been there for decades and they've been building, but what social media has allowed is for these things to come right to the surface and then to get amplified, as, as, as Roy was saying, like all of a sudden, 
on, on steroids. And so, yeah, I mean, it is one of those things, again, I'm not for regulation at the same time. You have to understand there's certain things that, that absolutely should not be encouraged and shouldn't be on there. I, what I'm concerned about a little bit in talking about you know, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, I remember sitting in New York City. It was Google's Political Innovation Summit. This was January of 2013, right after the 2012 elections. And it was just kind of a, about 120 of us, 130 of us, and they were just talking about best practices in the campaign, you know, Obama's digital team, Romney's digital team, which was terrible, um, <laughs> Ob Obama's field team, and this is a shock, there was no Romney field team. Um, that all to say, it really struck me sitting there, it was a great conference, oh my gosh, these guys, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and their ability to push or to not push certain things are going to have the ability to really decide in the future who wins. And that to me is one of my great concerns of, these guys have great responsibility, they have great power. In some ways I kind of consider them the robber barons of the 21st century. What are they going to do with the great power that's been given to them and how they, in, how they influence information flow and quite frankly influence elections? So Alex, did you see any of that in your campaign work? Because I think a lot of us were surprised, for instance, to find out recently that Facebook had an employee embedded in the Trump campaign. Hmm. I mean, I, I can't actually speak from the campaign experience, but what I can say um, in the last four years is that, you know, to Ned's point, there, there is a divide that has been growing, and that's something that we're very cognizant of now. Um, and there's a there's a sense to which um, like we might be uh, myopic in our analysis of this just being a political problem. Maybe there's something about the responsibility that we have as individuals, and maybe what's happening on the social media scene is again a symptom of something much deeper, much broader. I mean, people are pulling away from their communities in general. The sense that technology it has enabled us to live further distances from the people that we want to interact with. And when we do get home, we're inside. We're not on our front porch. We're inside maybe watching TV, so we're not necessarily interacting with the people right next to us. And now we're actually on our phones, so we're not even present. It's completely disembodied. Yeah. So what, you know, I, I think about this a lot in the sense that it has, a, it has to do with our orientation, whether we are approaching these platforms with a sense of, aha, like, I'm, I'm going to get you kind of thing. Um, and much more for our individual purposes of, I have 140 now, 280 characters to say something that is going to uh, determine how, you know, how much I'm worth and how many retweets I get versus, you know, are we actually oriented towards our community and using these platforms as an opportunity to bring our communities closer together? Are we actually facilitating um, a, a conversation where we can say, I am responsible for the things that I'm putting out on, on the internet, and that has to do with hate speech? Or, you know, I, I don't necessarily know that there's a right answer as to how and when and how much things should be regulated. Um, I mean, I, like, I, I tend to believe that there's, there's a role for that, but I also know that it's not, it's not necessarily going to work if it's not inherent in how, what we believe our role as citizens are to one another. But I think this self-policing thing is something that's very important. And I'll just share a quick personal story. I'm on the American Conservative Union board. We put on something called CPAC every year, big event back in DC. Um, unbeknownst to me, a certain Milo had been invited to speak on the main stage. And I'm trying to edit this in such a way as to be polite, and I basically threw a fit and said, there's no way this guy's going to come speak at CPAC. Um, he calls himself a fellow traveler of the alt-right. They have no space, no room, nothing to do with us as conservatives. There is no way he will speak on the main stage. It became a very uh, big issue if you were go back and Google Ned Ryan and Milo and CPAC. I mean, it, it, it became a big issue, but I said, there's no way that we should let this happen because we cannot embrace these people. They are not us. We want nothing to do with them. Eventually, he got disinvited over his comments on pedophilia, whatever it was. And I, I actually told the board, I'm really upset that that happened. Because 99.99% of Americans would agree with us that somebody that says those things should never be allowed a public platform. What we didn't have was the real debate on who should be a part of the conservative movement or not. 
And I think it's our responsibility as the American Conservative Union to in some way say, yes, these people should be you know, part of it and these people shouldn't be a part of it because it comes down to self-policing and saying, we want to actually put forth a, a, a certain message and a certain face to the public so people understand you might disagree with us, but at least you can have a rational conversation. This is not beneficial to us as an organization. He didn't end up speaking, again, was disinvited for the wrong reasons, but I think that kind of ties into a much larger picture of we as communities actually have to be self-policing and say, we are not associating with this behavior. We want nothing to do with it. Well, it's not going to happen. And bring up us. It happened, with, it happened in, in, in this situation. Yeah. It should happen a lot more. And we should. There is a proper role in society for ostracizing certain people. Yeah. Well, th I was going to come back to that point you made, uh, Karen, about um, hate speech. And in some ways, anybody that's ever been in the political business, every 24 months in October, uh, a reporter will call you and want to do it because they're doing their required story on negative ads. Why are we seeing so many negative ads? We all hate negative ads. Why are we seeing so many negative ads? And I get the same boring response to every reporter that calls me every two years in October. You as a voter will stop seeing them when you stop allowing them to infect your judgment about who to vote for. You get that because you tolerate that. And I realize that's a very trite thing to say, but the reality is there has to be some mechanism built to disincentivize that behavior or punish those who engage in it if you don't want it to continue. Similarly, until there are elected officials who actually pay an electoral consequence for either associating with or tolerating people of their party engaging in that kind of activity and speech, then they have no incentive to, to stand out. And in fact, look, you've seen the consequence. Uh, 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 the, there, there, are, there is right now an incentive, a, incentive, a perverse incentive structure in place where people who stand up and speak up pay a price. I mean, you know, the senator from Tennessee, senator from Arizona are paying a political price for calling out some nonsense within their own parties. I mean, the soon to be ex-senators from Tennessee. Right. Yeah. yeah. And look, I've got plenty of policy disagreements with both of them. I mean, they are not entitled to sainthood for what they're doing. Uh, and I disagree with many, many things they've said and done in the course of their careers in Congress. But they are at least of a slightly different type in their ability to say, that's wrong. We shouldn't tolerate that if we are who we say we are. And we're not going to get there if we don't actually uh, feel comfortable with sitting in discomfort and actually getting to know the people next to us who believe different things. Um, I mean, there's been a measurable impact on our levels of empathy. Right. Over the last 20 years, it's down 40% among college students. That's measured. If anybody hasn't read, except Sheriff for Dribbles. you guys, I'm sure. <laughs> right, You're very empathetic. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, I mean, like going back to the question of our tools shaping us, that's that's happening, and we're not actually taking the time to be self-reflective and say, like, okay, am I am I actually going to go out and and seek out an alternative perspective, so that when these hate filled ads are being aired, I'm not as likely to, you know, give money or, or like respond in a positive way. I actually have a shade of healthy skepticism because I care about that person who completely disagrees with me. I, I'm sorry, but the, the, you know, the real life laboratory that seems to be disproving all of that is right now is Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, there's a, there's a set of facts out there and a number of people in the United States Senate, Republicans are saying they are finding the you know, allegations against Roy Moore to be credible, but the world and all the reporters on the ground in Alabama are finding that, if anything, this is, like, stiffening his support. That's a product of a long period of tolerance, right? You've, you've created a set of people who have been incentivized to engage in just short of obvious behavior in certain ways, and so now it's broken out in the open, and the folks in D.C. who are, you know, wagging their finger now, were perfectly willing to tolerate it when it was a little more cleverly disguised over the last 20 years. Now it's being done in the wide open and it's embarrassing to them. So I, I want to be a little more reluctant to exonerate some of the people who, even though they're saying the right thing at the moment, they have been part of a system that rewarded behavior that got us to a place where someone does not, is being accused of sexually assaulting a 14-year-old and does not feel the social shame to step aside. I mean, that's a remarkable thing. Can I take a different perspective on this, which is, you know, to bring it back to the digital social mm -hmm. media space. I think when you talk about that and not the broader sort of cultural, civic kind of conversation and discourse, which is, I think, a huge problem, but just talking about hate speech on social media platforms, there's a real simple solution, which is Facebook and Twitter and these platforms 
hire more people, cut a little bit off the profit margin, and review the ads, review the posts before they go up more effectively. That solves that problem. Right. And they've committed to doing that. Now that doesn't address the larger issues of like Senate candidates in Alabama, but that certainly addresses the like, okay, are they gonna promote inappropriate ads on Facebook? That problem you can check off the list and right. move on to other ones. Make good point. Well, I think we'd like to open it up to your questions. We've got a couple of microphones here somewhere. So if anybody is, here we go. How about right up here? Hi, I had two questions. So firstly, regarding social media, you end up befriending people who have similar ideologies. So like the point you guys raised, you really don't know the alternate views. How do you increase that? And secondly, when you guys suggested you should do policing of, let's say, ads, what's getting posted, how do you justify that? Like, maybe something is what you believe is right. Like, I mean, obviously, there are a few issues which are clearly right and wrong. But when it comes to the gray area, how do you know if you are actually trying to stop that from appearing? You're not actually withholding the freedom of expression. I mean, I know one of the things I do, especially on Twitter, I'll follow people that are just the exact opposite of me. And then they'll tweet back, why are you following me? <laughs> I kind of want to have some people that have a different opinion. I kind of want to know why you're viewing the world the way you view the world. Oh, OK. So I mean, I do. I try and go follow other. I don't want to be hearing. I hear enough of my side of things. Mm -hmm. um, that's also why I try to go out and go on CNN and MSNBC on TV, and just so I can understand like what is actually the other side viewing, how they view the world, get a better understanding. Because I think you get so. You know, I know echo chambers been used in a different way, but we create our own little echo chambers um, in our own uh, in our own lives sometimes, in which we just get everything reinforced, and sometimes it reinforces our biases. And it's good to get out and say, "Huh, you don't view the world the same way I do. Why?" Um, to get that different perspective and understand, and it's healthy. It's a healthy thing to do. So, you know, again, that's one of the the negatives of social media is we do tend most people tend to create their own personal echo chambers where their own news streams come from a certain place where all their followers and Facebook friends are the same, view the world the same way. And again, it increases that polarization and that balkanization of us as a society. And I, you know, again, it's one of the negatives. I don't think that's a positive thing. We should be looking at others and saying, let's engage, if we can, hopefully in a rational way on social media and have that conversation. But it's one thing when you're talking about that in terms of listening to other people's opinions. But thanks in large part to social media, it's other people's facts. And uh, this, our, our fact checker at the Washington Post, uh, Glenn Kessler today, cataloged, and he's up to now pretty much, he's up to almost 1,600 non-factual statements that have been made by the President of the United States, primarily on social media. And his supporters consume things that are not just other points of view, they are other facts that are not true. Well, a couple of things on that. I mean, that's a product of a, of a conscious effort over a number of decades to discredit democratic institutions. I mean, the reality is you're not treated, Glenn Kessler is not treated as a neutral arbiter of fact. He's treated as a partisan combatant by a certain segment of our society. And we pay a price when we tolerate people not trying to have a fair-minded debate about a fact, but instead attacking a democratic institution. And, you know, the press, I mean, look, I have my fair share of irritations with uh, stories from uh, platforms that people assume I have alliance with, but that does not mean that they should be discredited. They play a vital role. But, but to your question about, about, you know, that sort of role of censor or, or determinant of what should or shouldn't be allowed to go on a platform, that's a very treacherous question, right, in the sense that these platforms have enormous power in terms of the audi access to audience. I mean, the Washington Post would not be the robust institution it is if it did not have the distribution mechanism of social media. Imagine how powerless any citizen would be if they're shut off from access to those platforms. And so, you know, I think the cynical view is those institutions are, have a reluctance because it's against their economic interest to, to limit audience, even if it's over controversy. That may be true. I think it's a relatively minor consideration. I think they want a healthy democracy. But man, they are very reluctant to get in the role of saying, this is true, that's false, this can go on the platform, that can't. They love operating outside. Uh, you know, they're, they're part of their wallpaper, right? They're a thing we all use, but we never stop to consciously think about the power they have and the role to play. The minute they start 
actively deciding? I mean, look at the, the white hot problem that Twitter found itself by verifying, you know, the guy from Charlottesville protests. I mean, like something as simple as a blue check mark exploded the world. Imagine if they start saying, I'm gonna let this person post and that person can't post because what they say is true and what they say is not true. Man, they don't want to be in that business, and I can understand it, but somebody's got to be in the business, or we've got to all decide that once someone has crossed some line, we're going to shun them, and we're not going to actually promote them, and reporters are no longer going to write about them because they've engaged in such prolonged, outrageous behavior, and they've been proven to be dishonest. Now, to Karen's think, point, Kessler said, you know, maybe Trump's crossed that line in terms of accumulated things. We can't say the president. We're not going to. times. Yeah, absolutely. we're not going to repeat what he says because he's proven to be too casual with the truth. But we got some problems like that to sort through. Can I just say, I think as you as you look at how do you sort of address the filter bias and the filter bubble with these social platforms, you know, I think you've got to be careful of, and I'm not saying that you were implying this, but I think you got to be careful of simplistic solutions that are just like, okay, we're going to, you know, only allow these sort of verified institutions to post, or, you know, we're going to force feed liberal content to conservatives and vice versa. Because I, I mean, I've seen some studies that show that just doesn't work. Like if you try and sort of push mm -hmm. a contrary view on someone, they're going to almost harden yeah. into their, their other view. Um, and the, the better approach is to sort of show a, a, a sort of their view on a spectrum um, or to show actual stories, personal stories of, of other people and other perspectives telling their story and that's very impactful. So as we think about how do you, and this is, this is this persuasion, right? This is changing perceptions, which is what we do in political campaigns and consumers do all the, or consumer marketers do all the time. I think you've gotta be careful about this. Um, and if, if, you're, if the outcome you're trying to achieve is a more nuanced view of this thing. Mm -hmm. To your point about uh, you know, how to avoid the, the echo chamber, the like filtering of the people who think like you, I, I think that we fall into um, the trap of thinking that social media can do it all for us. Why not just go out and like, meet somebody from across the spectrum and then friend them on Facebook? And then like, be intentional about going and interacting with them. And I think you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, sitting at your computer isn't necessarily going to fix it all, and we can't expect Facebook or Twitter to fix it all for us. But, um, and then like when, when you're consciously having conversations with them and seeking out alternative points of view, understand that having a good conversation is a skill. So this is a little bit of an unintentional plug, but we're, um, we're just starting a series of trainings, online trainings, on what it means to have an effective conversation. How do you actually listen? How do you actually understand what the other person is getting at rather than, um, than uh, exactly what they're saying at the face of it? Because people, to your point about Alabama, people don't change their mind because somebody presented a fact. Like, it takes, I mean, when's, when's the last time you, like, sat down at Thanksgiving dinner, had an argument, and, you know, suddenly the other person changed their mind? Right. <laughs> like, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. People are very rooted in their beliefs because it's an identity. So the more that you have real conversations about these things, and it's longitudinal, you're not going to achieve it all in one go. Right. It takes then, time. Then, it, yeah. But you have to have an orientation toward curiosity and, and being able to... Um, be wrong. Right. One thing. One thing you're starting to see too is um, with a with an app that I'm a, a huge fan of called Nextdoor, where the the whole approach is completely different. Where you're only basically allowed in these communities based on your address, and you have to verify your address. And you can see there how it completely changes the tone because there's really no algorithms in place. It's just people who are your actual neighbors. You can at least see what street they live on, what their name is, and you're only commuting communicating with people in your area. And it's just been fascinating to me to see how by removing those algorithms and by removing a lot of that automation, you actually start to see these uh, productive um, discussions happen, at least on a local level. Um, and we're, in Milwaukee, we're, we're seeing that a lot with uh, a lot of crime problems that we're having. And it's been fascinating to see that even in these neighborhoods where, let's just say, it's 50-50 Democrats and Republicans, on how the people you would assume are you know, have one position on something. They actually come and they have these conversations. And it's just interesting to see how people's views shift as they have these open conversations with people that they know. So um, it's apps like that where I'm curious to see how they evolve over time. You, you, you asked at the, I'm sorry. That sounds like a great app. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great, Nextdoor is a great app. But you asked at the beginning of this, you know, where is this going? And I think there's, there's a case to be made that 
you know, social media sort of broken down barriers between countries and global and all this mm -hmm. stuff, right? And maybe now the pivot, there's gonna be a return to local. Greater what, community. Greater community. Yeah. And whether it's, you know, you know, knowing your neighbors through next door, um, you know, uh, maybe a restoration, hopefully, of, of local news, which has been kind of decimated, and where does that come back? Um, maybe that's the next frontier or a next challenge to fix. Well, to, to Alex, to build on a point Alex made too, I think, um, look, it's, it's part of us, uh, I think I'll engage in the obligatory progressive self-loathing for a second. One of the things <laughs> is we tend to think that if we stack up enough facts, and I'm, look, I'm in a place with a lot of intellectual rigor, and you guys know how to, how to, how, how to compile your arguments and make them in a very compelling way, but the reality is uh, you gotta be a pretty effective storyteller, right? You sometimes right. have to, you know, because sometimes Per, per political side, I'm sure the other side sometimes feel this way, is because the other side misuses a tool, we tend to reject the tool. Right. They abuse storytelling to make the wrong point, so we're not gonna use it at all, we're just gonna lay out a bunch of facts and people will see the light of the way. I feel like well, you're describing what the Republicans have been doing. Right. Too, too many facts, <laughs> not many stories. Right. Don't but, appeal but, to the heart, they always wanna go to the head, and it's, right. it's a disaster. So that's that's point one. I think the other thing on the some of this hate speech, and uh, uh, forgive me if I get her name wrong, I think it's, Megan Phelps Roper, but I, I may have it wrong. She's the daughter of Fred Phelps, who was the pa longtime pastor of the Westboro, Westboro Baptist Church that uh, protested at funerals and a, a bunch of outrageous behavior. And she has an excellent te TED talk. I commend it to you. It's not about politics per se, but she, at one point in this TED talk, someone was asking her how she moved from that environment to a place where she left the church. And she said, you know, someone reach out to me. And, and what I say to them is you, can, you don't have to abandon your principles, just abandon your scorn. I just thought that was a really powerful thing. Like, to your point, Alex, engaging people, trying to find out why they think the way they do, convict, convince that you can maintain integrity to your belief system while hearing someone else's and, and seeing if you can figure out how to have a conversation. Um, that sort of not treating them scornfully as the starting point and expecting a conversation to follow seems like a pretty important pro tip to me. Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody else out there? Hi, um, thank you all for being here. Um, so I love the idea that uh, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and whatever could self-police, but given that there are private organizations that are geared towards a profit margin, like what do you think is the mechanism to motivate them to do that self-policing? Um, because the the idea that they're going to lower their profits seems a little bit implausible. Um, is it is it the 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 threat of all these anti antitrust lawyers um, making it making social media into a public good or any other things that you've? Um, uh, I mean, I, let me take a crack at this first. One, um, while I work in political digital ad spending. The reality is political digital ads account for a rounding error on Facebook's balance sheet. Like they make most of their money from corporate consumer work. Um, and so for them, I think, you know, this is about kind of trust and credibility in their platform. Um, and I think they have an incentive to self-police and sort of fix their, fix their house before you know, someone else comes in and enforces them too. So I think they have a lot of incentives to do the right thing. And I think the fallback and the sort of, that's the carrot, the stick is, if you don't, then you're gonna have it's the Josh Hawley's. Yeah, you're gonna have some burdensome yeah. regulation or you're gonna have lawsuits from. He's not know. the only attorney general either. Josh Hawley's not the only one that's starting to look at Google and some of these, these yeah. behaviors. Um, I, so I, I do just think have to that say he discovered this problem when he started running for the U.S. Senate. So I can't I, let it, I gotta be partisan a little you bit. You can be partisan there. <laughs> he Regardless, became. he came to the right conclusion. Uh, depending on whatever the motivation was, but he came to the right conclusion. Just saying. And I think that's part of it, is a threat of more and more of this, of either you will change your behavior or there will be the stick coming. And some of the, some of the solutions that Facebook came up with on their own, um, actually it will make it S somewhat more challenging for uh, those of us who do digital advertising in that they want us to, they basically will display all ads that are run. And one thing with digital advertising that you can do with TV is you test a ton of creative. So basically, then what's the one thing I'm trying to figure out as I kind of read up on this is what the reporting period is on that. Is it, do we have to follow the 24 hour rule as well? Because then, you know, let's say I'm working against Joe in a primary, 
I can look and see what he's testing. And they also want to list audience and spend, which also creates a unique problem for agencies because they have markups. Our company doesn't, connectivismedia.com. Uh, but <laughs> some of them will have markups, which is how they pay their staff. Um, so there's really all true listing. Out of the shadows now. Out of the, now, out of the so yeah, there's, there's a, of your heart. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you know, interesting things that they've come up with on their own that'll actually make it a little more uh, challenging. But just like every time a network or a, or a company has changed something, we adapt and, and we figure it out. And I think uh, giving them the opportunity to fix it, and I think they've been uh, pretty aggressive with their, with their threats. Um, and Al Franken seems to be doing a number with his questioning. Um, I, I think uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how they respond, and I think you'll start seeing some of those responses quickly, and if they don't work, I'm sure the, the strong arm of the government will start either increasing their threats or start throwing more on them. Yeah. In my mind, the regulatory risk far exceeds, from their standpoint, the economic trade-off. So they, there is, in my view, some uh, interest in self-policing. Yes. Yes. A clumsy regulation would be far more costly. Yes. Uh, I think we have a question here. Um, several um, former Facebook engineers have recently either written or given interviews in which they've described how the um, algorithms themselves are designed to be addictive and are designed to include mm -hmm. um, rather powerful behavior modification um, in, in, uh, techniques. Um, and I, I wonder if you could um, address this. I think someone in the beginning mentioned the psychological impact of social media. Um, and it seems to me that the, the, I don't know, the base assumption here is that emotional manipulation is good, but not too much. Um, but it seems to me that these algorithms um, and the interfaces that we use um, are inherently um, uh, powerful in ways that we're not aware of. Uh, and I wonder how we begin to address that on the level of politics. So uh, a study came out a year ago that said that on average, American adults spend 10 hours and 39 minutes a day interacting with screens. That's cell phones, tablets, TV, movies, whatever. Um, and it was already up an hour from the year before. So I don't expect that that, you know, it will increase by the same amount, but it's already been a year. There's a lot going on that is addictive, and everybody's in on that game. That's a business. I don't know if that's ever going to change. I think that what we have to do is be more cognizant as consumers. I, it, yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's true. It's true. It's very difficult. But um, I don't know if you can regulate that so much. It's really tough. Um, my, my wife regulates herself by leaving Facebook. And then she comes back onto Facebook, and she leaves Facebook. I think there's been at least three or four times in the last mm -hmm. year. I, I mean, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, the scary thing is they've tapped into human nature and understanding who we are right. and understand that there is highly addictive aspects to us. So unless we change who we are as human beings, I'm not really sure how you can truly address that. You know what I'm saying? But I think academic, I mean, I would encourage research to be conducted. We need to know what will counteract some of that behavior. I mean, look, that phenomenon, it sounds like a confessional by an engineer, yeah, like it's a big secret. There are books published on it. There are blogs dedicated uh, to neuro, you know, uh, how to do that. The, the entire platform of Snapchat is based on, I can't miss it because it'll all be gone in 24 hours. So I got to look today and I got to start again tomorrow. So it is like hidden in plain sight. But where I think psychological research can help us is we look, we, need, we now know that somebody says a lie and you publish a fact check, that does not undo the damage of the lie. We need some psychological research that says what does undo the damage of the lie. And we need to know what toolkit can we be armed with as citizens to say, okay, I'm going to get the good here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abandon the bad. And maybe somebody will inv invent the next billion dollar company that says, here's the app that I lay over my laps, er, apps that tells me how to not get pulled in uh, to the wormhole. I don't know what that is, but I think it's a, it is a real problem. But I think part of what I, I get bothered by is when the press reports it as a scandalous secret, when it's open and notorious, and, and what we need is better thinking. You know, we won't overcome the problem with the same level of thinking that got us into the problem, you know, to rip off. Here, here's my starting point for that research, which I think is a great idea. Casinos, gambling. Right. Uh, the very and, and they, the engineers, um, a number of these platforms basically went out and hired the casino game designers 
to go and work at their platforms to teach them and teach their engineers how to optimize just like a slot machine. And the loyalty cards. A slot machine is highly optimized for returns based on a certain interval to keep people hooked and playing the slot machine. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of sort of studies and, you know, people have done a lot about the harms of, of gambling. I, I play poker and blackjack. I love it. It's a little fun. You go into the casino and say, I'm going to lose, you know, 100 bucks and that's it. And then I'm going to walk out. Think a similar thing with social media. Like I'm going to check my status, um, but I'm not going to sit on my phone all day during dinner and ignore my wife. Um, so I think I think as a starting point, like you know, we've had you know addictive, engaging entertainment experiences before. Facebook and Twitter and these app platforms are the newest iteration of it. Starting point. Look at what we've done with these other ones and, and how to address it here. One last thing I'll say on that is, and forgive me, I don't know who did the study. I don't remember all of the details, but the takeaway that I took was that there was a study on addiction with rats. They put cocaine in the water, and they got addicted, and they died. They kept on going after the water with the cocaine instead of the regular water. But then somebody had the brilliant idea of saying, OK, these are rats in a cage. What was their environment like? And so can I conduct a study where they have the same tubes of water and actually, there's a really fun playground for rats. It's like rat heaven. And so they like went on the wheels and they like played around on the fake trees or whatever it was. And they didn't actually go after the water with the cocaine because they actually had an under like they were more um, there was more available for them. So I think the actual antidote to something like that is real relationships, things that feed you in ways that the addiction cannot. Because as much as social media is addictive and it's cool to see people's pictures, it's not a substitute for the real thing. It can connect you to people across the world that like, you wouldn't have otherwise formed relationships with. But if you are closely knit in your community and there are things going on, you're going to go. It's the same thing. It's the Snapchat FOMO thing. You're going to go out to that thing because it's happening instead of staying online and trolling through also, Facebook for you. Yeah, it goes back to the self-governance. Yeah, absolutely. You have to set up the right habits. Yeah, I mean, there's certain. We're not talking about how to, in a general sense, how to make people's lives more fulfilling. We're talking about access to uh, information uh, that allows us to be uh, engaged and informed participants in our democracy. So that's right. People will get off social media if, you know, and they'll stop going for the cocaine water if their lives are more rich. <laughs> don't um, drink the cocaine water. Don't go for the cocaine water. Talking. Uh, Sorry, I wish but I we're had a big point coming out know. of this panel. No cocaine water, kids. Just say no. Uh, <laughs> say no. <laughs> but we're also talking, uh, as we started talking about, you know, the access to the Washington Post is right. increasingly through social media. Mm. So um, uh, it is, in addition to everything else, Twitter is a great news aggregator. Um, so, so it's really on this level that my question was directed, yeah, not uh, exactly. whether people can break their habits for you know Instagram. And so. we have like entire teams of people who will sit there and they watch individual stories and what's happening, and they will sit there and rewrite the headline two or three times uh, to make it more right. if to make it more That's shareable. It turns out that putting the word actually in a headline, it makes people want to share it more. Like. Red meat actually makes you healthier. Mm. It's, huh. The word actually is apparently like cocaine yeah. water yeah. for Actu headlines. Actually. <laughs> actually, cocaine water. <laughs> so, any more? Bad. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any more questions, actually? Uh, oh, we must have one more. Well, we don't. OK. So I do have, have one more. As, as where, what do you think is like? the next big thing in social media, as, and, and specifically in a political context. I mean, we've had a president who can't have his phone taken out of his hands. What, what do we do next? I think um, an area that I'm really interested in and kind of looking at is, uh, is virtual reality and augmented reality. Huh. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what that platform allows and where it's going to go, um, you know, is really interesting. Whether it's the Oculus Rift or it's just kind of enabling it on on phones, um, I don't. I don't think anyone is really sort of figured out how to how to leverage that. But um, I think that technology is big. I think it's there's a lot of people kind of chasing it. 
And when someone starts to figure it out in a political context, uh, I think that'll be that'll be big. So I think that's going to be big in the next two years or year. I think that uh, back to the the next story up. I think that's going to be uh, an interesting uh, revolution. Uh, the idealist in me hopes that people sort of return back to the you know all politics is local mentality and start engaging with their neighbors because that has a ripple effect for all sides. Um, and you start to see that with their growth. I didn't realize until a few days ago, Nextdoor has actually been around for 10 years. And they've been very cautious about opening up their API to certain advertisers around political stuff. So everything that's happening there is relatively organic. It's neighbors talking to other neighbors about different issues that are happening. Um, and, and seeing that happen and kind of seeing how that goes, that's, um, that's something that I think will be really interesting for the future if that stuff takes off even more, um, which it seems to be. So it'll be interesting to follow. Well, uh, Karen, I think what's interesting is if you go back to the example of President Trump, I mean, we, we all know the ways, or not, maybe all, but many people believe that that's a tool that he has misused, but it could also be used in a very constructive way. Imagine, and imagine a president that instead of attacking the institutions of our democracy, whether it's the free press or our law enforcement community or whoever it might be, imagine a president that was using that to build up or, or uh, and, and look, there's risks of propaganda on the positive side, just like there is on the negative side. But I think some, some of this is about how these tools get used, what they're used to communicate about the agenda setting function of people with large audiences can be. I, I mean, I joke with my clients, there are really only two things anymore. There's content and there's distribution. So the social media tools are distribution and the distribution is only as valuable as the quality of the content you're pushing through them. So a centered leader who has something meaningful to say can use these tools in very powerful and constructive ways just as someone who is not terribly centered and doesn't have much to say that's constructive can use them in a destabilizing way. So I think it is less about the innovation of the tools and more about the quality of the people that put their thumbs to the screen. Well, I wanna thank all of you. I think we are just about out of time and I know you guys have classes and they change and so I wanna thank you all for spending your, uh, your hour here with us as well. Thanks a lot. Great discussion. Roy, Thomas, Alex, Joe, Ned, thank you very much. You've been great. It was a terrific discussion. Karen, thank you very much for, for moderating. Great job. And uh, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I got to tell you, I, I don't think you could. Uh, this was a pretty remarkable conversation, if you ask me. So I hope you enjoyed it, too. Take care.